weather than our last event. We had good weather, so now we're back to the mainstay. So thank you all for venturing the return to cold. Um, so today we are here for uh, a fantastic folk talk, and it's great to have uh, Dr. Shiraz Mayer here. Um, so just to give you some background or uh, lay out the event, what we're going to do is a, a brief introduction and sort of talk about um, where this book sort of fits in. Uh, Shiraz will talk. I'll uh, abuse my privilege as the moderator and ask him a few questions myself, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So just to dive in and give you his background, um, Dr. Shiraz Mayer is a, the director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College London in the War Studies Department. Uh, he currently leads ICSR's research on Syria and uh, the conflicts in Syria and Iraq, and is also, as we know from his fantastic book, um, a scholar on Salafi Jihadi uh, soteriology. Um, um, he's also, uh, as among many other things, an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins and a contributing writer, uh, regular writer for New Statesman. Very pleased to see uh, his latest works regularly come out. Um, and he frequently writes on Islamic State in the broader Middle East. Uh, beyond these great accomplishments, he's had the both daunting and annoying job of being my supervisor in the past. So among interviewing jihadists, he's dealt with many difficult people in the past. <laughs> um, so today we're here to discuss his book, Salafi Jihadism, The History of an Idea. Um, it's been widely acknowledged as a groundbreaking uh, exploration of the political philosophy behind contemporary jihadist movements. Uh, and to sort of summarize where, where it stands, it charts the intellectual foundations of the Salafi Jihadist movement from its origins to really its most recent uh, standing in, in contemporary conflicts. It's incredible to see um, how it threads together matters concerning both theory and practice, and how the ideas uh, sort of are, are an interplay with contemporary politics and the interpretations as uh, political events evolve, whether it's um, in Algeria or, or in Syria, and, and sort of tracking movement. Um, and this is particularly important given that the concept of uh, Salafi jihadism itself is not conventionally well defined. And trying to sort of identify its components uh, is something that Shiraz does really well. So in the book, he divides Salafi jihadism into sort of five basic components that he identifies. And today, these still remain really vital to different groups. Uh, which is why it's so relevant to our discussion as we sort of talk about the future of ISIS, as well as groups in Idlib, uh, Philippines, and around the world. Uh, so without further ado, I want to hand it over to Shiraz. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Audrey. Thank you to all of you for coming here on what feels like a very uh, British morning with miserable weather outside. <laughs> um, I want to thank POE as well for putting us on. They are uh, old and long-standing friends of both myself and ICSR, um, and so it's been great to watch the, uh, the program as well just take root here and see the sort of great work you guys have done collectively over the last three years. Um, so it's great uh, to be here and to, to talk to you today. Um, yeah, I'm a historian by training, and what I noticed was there was a lot of great literature sitting out there looking at the sort of evolution of the jihadi movement as it had sort of evolved over time uh, from the conflicts in Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s against the Soviet Union all the way through uh, uh, to the post 9 11 environment. Um, but there'd never been a systematic sort of examination and interrogation of the ideas of who these guys were in terms of from an ideological perspective. So there was a lot of very good work saying, you know, Bin Laden was here with the state and he met with these guys and they uh, planned that attack, for example. But someone interested in the history of ideas, interested to see how these things evolved over time, I really wanted to sort of try and chart the way this movement had evolved from an intellectual perspective. There were enough books out there uh, where they talked about their own ideas, they talked about their own sense of uh, justifying uh, whatever it was that they were doing and, and sort of laying out a framework for war and a, a sort of framework for conflict that they were engaged in. And you could see uh, a very, very obvious trajectory towards greater nihilism over time. And if you look at the fighters who fought against uh, the Soviet Union, that sort of first wave of you know, foreign fighters, as we could call them today, uh, there was no suicide bombings. They fought against uh, uniformed soldiers. They were by themselves in an army. They spoke about themselves very much 
in that way. You can go uh, on YouTube today still and find a video by one of uh, Abdullah Azam's closest sort of right hand men called uh, Tamim al Adnani. He condemns uh, uh, Palestinians for hijacking. He says, This is not what we're about. We don't hijack planes. We don't believe in this stuff. He used to travel here regularly to the United States to fundraise for uh, uh, the jihad back here. And the world was a very, very different place. And uh, Florida was a frequent stopping point for him. So the point is, these were individuals who had their own sort of sets of ideas and theories, and you saw this migration all the way through to Islamic State and all the ultra-violence and barbarism of what we saw that group carrying out um, uh, uh, over the last few years, really, until uh, you know, the, their project was wrapped up and pushed back. So I decided to say, well, look, they need to collect all these books and start to break it down. And I essentially did that by breaking up uh, Salafi Jihadism into five core ideas, which are the sort of foundational uh, uh, points of my book, uh, where I say, here are the five things, here's how they sit. Um, and it also, it was important to, I suppose, grade the movement, right? Because Salafism itself has kind of been conflated with terrorism or violence, um, whereas Salafism you know, is a very, very broad uh, tradition. Uh, within Islam. And I uh, think it was important to try and show that, look, the vast majority of Salafis are, in fact, not violent. They are individuals who are concerned with themselves. They're concerned with their own souls and getting themselves and their kids and families to heaven. And, you know, they'll spend uh, lots of time debating quite banal and esoteric points of theology as it relates to ritual practice. And they don't want to change the world. They want to change uh, themselves. And then, of course, uh, you have a slightly more politically engaged uh, uh, activist, sometimes called the Sahwa Salafis, um, who uh, you find predominantly in the Gulf and in, in, in Arab countries, where they're kind of plugged into the system. You've seen them become more active uh, again after the Arab uprisings of 2011. Um, and these are, again, guys who will prod the system. They will needle the system. They will criticize what's happening, but they don't call for a radical or revolutionary change. I think. You know, they are actually one of the more interesting uh, categories here because certainly for, for very religious societies uh, and for conservatives living in, in these Middle Eastern countries, if you're going to start to move towards more open political systems where people will engage with the government and they will talk to it and so on, then you need to have these guys creating models of consent. A very interesting book, for example, came out, I talk about it in my book, uh, by Salman Oda, uh, Saudi, uh, uh, you could say activist Salafi, who's in jail now, uh, um, but he argued for you know rights with responsibilities in relation to the Arab uprising, saying to people, "I don't support uprisings. I don't think you should come out in the street and protest. But you absolutely have the right to go and agitate for your rights. You have the right to ask for certain things off the government. At the same time, says to the government, you have a responsibility as well." You have to recognize people with legitimate rights. You have to give them uh, things they ask for. And if you don't, you can't hold back the tide forever. The dam will burst at some point. Um, so I think this does begin to uh, articulate an interesting model of consent and political engagement for uh, uh, conservatives. Um, they don't really exist so much in the West because they're not interested in engaging with Western political systems. Right? They're mostly, I'd say, uh, prominently placed within the Arab world, more so within Gulf. Um, but it's the last sort of category of the Salafis itself, which that the violent manifestation of it, which wants to reject the entire system, which wants to overthrow and challenge the existing order as it uh, stands, both within the localities of where they're operating, but also within the international system as a whole. Uh, they want to challenge it uh, uh, and fight it. So that's the bit I was most interested in looking at. These are obviously uh, the, the, the guys who are causing the greatest um, trouble right now, um, and so it's important to try and start to uh, pare down some of their ideas. And so the five ideas that I hold as being sort of most integral to the movement uh, are unsurprisingly jihad, if you're going to be a Salafi jihad, you have to believe in jihad. Um, Takfir, um, Anwar al Bara, Tawheed, and Hakimir. And I will say this, all of these concepts, I'll go through them uh, briefly, very briefly, but all of these concepts, especially exist within normative Islam, and all of them are contested. And so it was important for me when I wrote this book, when I approached this topic, to say, look, 
I'm not getting into a space of making value judgments about what is a correct or an incorrect interpretation, or what is good theology and what is bad theology. That's the role for Islamic scholars to do. Now, that is not uh, where an academic sits in terms of this debate or this context. The jihadi movement itself has its own understanding of these concepts and of these ideas. And therefore, I said, I'm going to take their understanding of these ideas as the given, as the starting point. Because that's how they refer to it, that's how they conceive of it. And what we're interested in is their conceptualization of those ideas. And so that's an important uh, starting point uh, in that debate because um, you will hear at some point, I'm sure, me say something, say, but that's not a sort of ordinary understanding of that idea. It's true, in many cases, these guys are operating somewhere. But it also speaks to the point that they do refer to law. When we see what Islamic State has done, when we see what Al-Qaeda has done, or these other groups have done, these are not whimsical actors. There is reference and recourse to law, there is reference and recourse to theology, there is an attempt at least by them to construct a ideological worldview based on scripture. And that is a reality, and that is just the way it is. Whether you accept those as being uh, normative or not, or mainstream or not, or uh, esoteric really comes down to where you, where you stand uh, on this, but it is a construction, and uh, that building of that construction is very important. So the first of those ideas I can mention jihad, are clearly from the jihadi movement, they say this is one of the most important aspects of Islam, and what they say is that you know the notion of jihad, yes, it has a linguistic uh, uh, attribute, right, which is to struggle, it has a linguistic meaning, but so it has a legal meaning too. And the legal meaning is to fight. Therefore, when God talks about jihad, specifically in the Quran, for example, it is linked to fighting. And therefore, to achieve the legal aim of this word, or to realize its legal meaning, you have to fight. Um, so they kind of pair it down in that way. And the, the, I suppose the attempt or the approach is to rationalize or to normalize jihad as a physical fight in the way that any other ritual aspect would exist for a Muslim. So praying, fasting, praying charity, performing a pilgrimage, this is saying jihad also exists on that plane. Right? And it's sort of an attempt to normalize it into that. And unsurprisingly, of course, the jihadi movement uh, uh, values jihad very, very highly. Uh, it's the sort of lifeblood of what the group uh, does. But I also noticed that they've taken some very interesting ideas. So um, part of the Islamic penal code has something called which relates to personal injury, right? It's like in the Western legal system, it would be tort law, right? It's really about negligence or something like that, and restitution for an individual suffering personal harm. And what they do is they take that principle and they elevate it to a point of international relations. So this idea of reciprocity, of violence, or as you would have seen in Al-Qaeda's literature, traditionally, you know, we were attacked, we attacked back, you bombed our school, we bombed your city, that kind of... Uh, uh, narrative and discourse is based around that idea. It's based around that idea. Uh, and so it's a, an interesting way to show how this movement takes certain ideas that exist, it's a well-established part of the Islamic legal system, it exists, and to essentially migrate it into uh, a, a concept of war. And you can see debates taking place even within the jihadi movement uh, about a sort of liberal embrace of that idea, how it's been used and applied in very broad uh, brush strokes. Because, of course, under an ordinary situation under Qasas, I would seek redress against the individual who caused me that harm. So, if Audrey does something, I suffer the harm. Mm -hmm. I have recourse against her, not against POE or something else. And so, this idea that you have uh, a dispute at a political level, that you go and attack a country, saying, oh, you, you're not holding the person involved or the person responsible accountable, <coughs> you're holding the general populace uh, accountable. So there are lots of debates sitting within the literature about that, but these debates, as I say, relate very closely to how uh, the war is prosecuted, essentially, and how these actors believe uh, uh, that they should act. The fear, the second of the ideas I look at, uh, sort of, I suppose, encapsulated in a nutshell again, is essentially the process of excommunication, the process of declaring other Muslims to be outside. Uh, of the faith, and this idea, uh, I think, really roars back into prominence and relevance 
uh, in 2003, after the invasion of Iraq from Mohammed Salva Sokawi, who's leading Al Qaeda in Iraq and who is really at the forefront of uh, the insurgency against uh, the US and Britain and other countries that were participating in that war, um, he unleashed this genie, which uh, we can see until today has not been put back in the bottle. I don't think it can really be put back uh, for quite some time. This is a very, very dangerous uh, uh, idea insofar as it, its destructive element, that sectarian conflict that is tearing up the Levant in particular, that is driven uh, by this. And so far we revived it with real menace um, uh, once he uh, uh, sort of started that fight in 2003. To the extent that even the central leadership of Al Qaeda wrote to him and said, listen, tone this down. Concentrate on fighting the Brits and the Americans. We'll worry about the Shias another day. And he said, no, I'm here. I understand the reality. You guys are thousands of miles away. Let me take this fight forward. And you know, to the extent that he says, the Shias are worse than Britain and America. He said, those guys don't pretend to be Muslims. We know what they are. But these guys are pretending. They're the insidious threat. They're the th inside the threat. We need to take care of them now. And so um, that has unleashed as I say, this very uh, nasty uh, fratricidal and uh, sectarian conflict that continues to rage uh, today on both sides, right? And the language used by both sides is increasingly uh, hyperbolic and millenarian in terms of their sense of other. So this is particularly uh, destructive. The notion of al wala al is really uh, something that doesn't have a sort of straightforward uh, translation into English, but essentially it's of hell to mean like love and hate or loyalty and disavowal for the sake of God. And again, this traditionally was used in terms of, particularly in sort of the early uh, phases of Islam, in the sort of Meccan phase when uh, Islam was sort of emerging in this heavily polytheistic society, as a sort of personal conduct way of distinguishing yourself as a Muslim from that Meccan society. So having different uh, festivals, like Sajjah Eid, uh, dressing slightly differently, different greetings, so that Islam was distinguishing itself from that prevailing environment. It becomes, again, uh, relevant as a political tool in really the uh, formation of Saudi Arabia. When Saudi Arabia, sort of, when you're seeking to build alliances with other tribes, when the Al Saud are sort of building alliances, trying to build alliances, they're sort of using this principle now for the first time in a slightly more political context to say, well, your tribe should work with our tribe against those people over there. So it becomes a sort of basis of treaties and alliances and so on. But once the Third Saudi Kingdom is established, essentially the uh, issues laid to bed, right? That you don't need it anymore, you've got your nation state now, it's a stable country, the issues put to bed. It roars back into public debate and consciousness uh, during the point that I think is probably the single most important event in the intellectual development, at least, of radical Islamic thought, uh, which was when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. When he invades Kuwait in 1990, a unique series of events take place, right? The House of Saud asks the United States to come and to get rid of this guy, to expel Saddam and to restore the Kuwaiti monarchy to their position. Which the United States agrees uh, to do, of course, along with various other countries. But this sparked a debate in Saudi, which was unprecedented in the history of that country which was for the first time you had public dissent, for the first time you had people questioning the wisdom of the government and what it was doing, because of this notion that the Arabian Peninsula is holy soil. And therefore, to invite the United States to establish military bases on that holy soil was an anathema uh, uh, to conservatives and religious radicals at the time. I could say anecdotally, uh, I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I was in Saudi Arabia when this happened. I was about 10 years old, 11, but this debate was powerful even to someone as young as me. That's the first time I remember thinking, like, wow, what, what is this? And you just hear in mosques, like, this discussion about the U.S. principally. Why are they here? Why are they established this place? This is colonialism, even though the House of Saud had invited them in. And this sort of dispatching of government clerics to major mosques across Riyadh and Jeddah and elsewhere to explain what was happening try and you know, win public opinion. But that sense of public debate had never existed in that way until that moment. And that's where, again, the 
radical sort of thinkers, people like Abu Muhammad al-Baqisi, for example, and others began to start to write about al wala al to say, look, you can't make these alliances. This is, a, this is our doctrine of what an alliance should look like, and you know, clearly it cannot apply to the United States, to Britain, and to uh, non-Muslim countries. Um, and that becomes a real agitational point. It becomes a real sticking point, essentially, in that relationship between uh, the House of Saru and these radicals who are responding to that moment. So, uh, again, very, very important moment in the development of this idea. And of course, it then gets revived again and put into sharp relief post 9 11, when countries like Pakistan and others are again uh, participating in the war on terror. Um, they take on great prominence, of course, to help uh, um, either the war in Afghanistan or in Iraq, the Gulf countries. So, that issue gets revived very strongly. And put into play. Of course, this is also the principle under which the Taliban refused to hand over Osama bin Laden after September 11th. When George Bush said, Give us this guy, it was the principle of Al Wala al Barad that was invoked and cited by him saying, No, look, our loyalty is to this guy. Even if we disagreed with what he did, our primary loyalty still resides with him and not with you. So that's the kind of uh, way that that idea has played out. Um, and you saw again in Al-Qaeda literature, at least, a lot of praise for the Taliban in terms of saying, you know, look, they stood firm, they held on to their principles, they didn't compromise, despite knowing that the United States was going to push in very hard uh, uh, in, in the aftermath of those attacks. The most, I think, interesting, and I was very, like, wrestling with my own sort of mind when I wrote the thing, was the fourth idea of Tawhid, because, again, to reiterate, this is none of this is to make a value judgment. All Muslims believe in Tawheed. If you had to say the words Islam in one word, it would be Tawheed. Right? It's the Islamic concept of monotheism. So this is it. But again, it's the construction of this idea within jihadi literature that I found really fascinating. And it was Abdullah Azam really who came through to uh, shape this idea. He said, look, God is owed his duties in multiple ways. Right? So when it's prayer time, you have to physically and pray. Paying charity, we could do that online, right? You could just pay your charity uh, 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 that way. You could, um, you have to do all these in fasting, again, it's a physical act, you have to give God his dues in that way. But some of it is just intellectual affirmation, the idea that God is eternal is an intellectual affirmation, you just believe it, right? You can't really demonstrate that in any particular way. It's just part of your core belief. But one of the things that is doctrinal part of the Islamic belief is the notion of divine decree and predestination that God has fixed everything. So one of the things Muslims believe is, for example, like your lifestyle is fixed, it's determined by God. And there's nothing you can do to extend your life or to shorten it. God has sort of appointed you a fixed term. So Abdullah Azam says, okay, this can be demonstrated practically. You have to demonstrate your belief in this concept practically. And the way you do that is by essentially risking your life. Because if you really believe in this concept, you will die next week at 2 p.m. <coughs> on Friday. Like that's what will happen. Then you would be just as likely to die walking the streets of D.C. or Paris or Rome as you would being in Raqqa. So you have to come and fight jihad. It's only when these bullets are flying past your head that you're really showing God that you understand this concept is real. Because the bomb might go off there and kill me, and all these left with not a scratch. So he's saying, look, this is the way you demonstrate it. So it's interesting, because he links it to the concept of Tawheed. Okay, so this is one of the branches of Tawheed, and you have to demonstrate it. So what he's saying, really, is you can't be a true monotheist. You can't satisfy God's various requirements on you as a Muslim unless you fight jihad. It's incredible. I mean, it's the, the level of kind of, in a sense, of theological blackmailing that takes place is remarkable, right? Say that you are deficient in your faith by not being here. Like you will never satisfy the ultimate goal of Islam, which is to satisfy the monotheism of God. So it's a really uh, interesting idea. You can also see now, again, similarly with this idea, this is how you keep your troops motivated on the battlefield. So when ISIS is throwing men into Kobani and they're, they're dying, 
and they just launch wave after wave of attack to try and get to Kobani. It's like God, God will determine what happens, right? We just have to make the effort. Maybe we'll take Kobani in an hour. Maybe we'll take it in three months. But we have to expend the effort. God delivers the result. In the same way, that's how you keep your troops motivated when the chips are down. We've lost Raphael. We've lost Mosul. We're the final guys in Baruz. That's okay. God rewards, God punishes, God tests. We, we don't see the divine wisdom. We just have to keep going. And that's how you find the sort of narrative and, and discourse of motivation, essentially, uh, uh, being used by them. Uh, and so, um, for those of you who follow this very closely, you will have seen just before uh, Baruz was uh, finally taken back, I think at least a 15 minute video from inside, and there was a lot of references to precisely this kind of video. We will win. Right? Because if you kill us, we're going to paradise, or we're going to fight our way out. Um, and this is like the ultimate hardcore left at the end. But that sort of sense of we rely on God. Right? That's really the, the core theme of that video. We're relying on God. God will determine what happens. We just have to expend the effort. That's our obligation to make the effort. So, uh, again, all of this linked. The overarching concept of Tawheed is very, very, very interesting um, because, as I say, it's fundamentally saying unless you perform jihad, you're deficient as a Muslim. And, and it's, it's, it's very profound in that way. But also, again, if, if you're someone who embraces that concept, it's an emancipation, right? Because you're not afraid of anything now. You're, you're just going to go for it. And so it's, 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 it's ability to influence the individual and create a sort of fearlessness in them. And then the final uh, sort of idea out of the five, really, um, was that concept of, of Hakimir, on which, interestingly, it's this notion of Islamic governance, essentially, or sovereignty of God in, in the political, or political realm. And what's interesting is that the jihadi movement has the least to say about this idea. And I think that's because the debate is kind of already established out there because you have a lot of literature from groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and others who sort of theorize what governance looks like. And they clearly take a, a much more austere uh, view on what that, you know, what the manifestation of the structure of that governance should look like. But the baseline idea to implement Sharia, you know, have a Khalif or you know, an executive, all of that, they kind of feel like the debate's been taken care of. But they don't talk about it so much. There is no big seminal text from the jihadi movement say on this issue. And what's interesting to say is that in most literature it's more historic. It finds its intellectual roots actually in the Indian subcontinent, most of the other ones we looked at, the things that all happened in, uh, in Saddam, invading Kuwait, or the Algerian war, very big in terms of the development of Qisas, the tool of war and stuff. All of that relates to political what's happening in the uh, Arab world. But in terms of Hakimiya, it's really the, the Muslim campaign uh, in British India get rid of the Brits from there, that started this process of thinking. And then a lot of those books written by people like Maldudi and others were translated into Arabic, where people like Qutbub experienced them and encountered them. And that cross-pollination of ideas from there seeps into the Arab world and then finds a much broader audience, of course, in uh, the Arab world. And that was the thing about Maldudi. Maldudi didn't speak Arabic, but he had people around him who were fluent, who were translating his books and his literature constantly into the Arabic. Uh, and that's what found a pretty broad uh, audience. So that idea has an interesting trajectory. It's more historic. It finds its roots elsewhere. But you can see the first three ideas are fairly operational, right? They're the ones that have a battlefield relevance. And you find the vast majority of literature applying to those three ideas at the top because they are live issues. If you are blowing up a marketplace in Baghdad, you know, as Al-Qaeda in 2004, you need to explain and justify and rationalize that, why you're doing it, because you're trying to carry public opinion, particularly when you're killing the very people whose defense you claim to be active. So it needs to kind of try and rationalize these things. So there's a lot of literature on those first three ideas, less so on the last two, and you find that those first three, there's kind of an ad hoc, real kind of battlefield theology that's been created. Um, so again, the, the, the incident on Wadi Qasaspe, for example, the Jordanian pilot who was burned alive Cage, you know, provoked a huge debate, and it provokes a massive discussion about 
validity of what happened and whether to kill someone by fire was allowed or not. And that was one of you could say, cornerstones of that uh, discussion. Interestingly, of course, Islamic State didn't engage with that debate. It published like two lines, three lines, saying, "Here's what we've done." But it was the Al Qaeda theorists who were writing loads about this issue, saying, "How do we understand this? How does it?" And that was really the difference between the two groups. Al Qaeda, for all of its crimes, for all of its atrocities, had a bunch of scholars within the movement, and it produced a lot of law. It produced a lot of sort of theoretical framework, essentially, to try and theorize and think through what it is that it's doing, um, and has a debate within the movement. Islamic State, to my mind, is a group much more concerned with deriving authority by praxis, so essentially by doing. Here is our state. We've built it. Look how big it is. It's the only terrorist group that I know that had its own strap line, slogan. Baki al Khatamani, remaining and expanding. Right? And that remaining and expanding is really, really interesting. It shows you their mindset. We've built this thing. Here it is. It remains. Oh, look, it's also expanded. It's not going anywhere. It's, it's broke. But that was really the basis of its authority. That was the basis on which it sought to validate and legitimize itself. The rest of the movement, as I say, does seem to have more of a concern with sort of theorizing things and producing things and thinking them through. I'll end with this final uh, point before I open it up. Um, it's clear that war, conflict, has been principal driver of intellectual and ideological change with uh, uh, this movement. And we see that all the way through from the 1980s. So when you have different crises, <coughs> new ideas get thought, new ideas get debated, and they build and they move on. The conflict in Syria has produced, again, another, I think, very interesting uh, phase to this. Essentially, what you've noticed in Idlib, in the northwestern part of, of Syria, where Sham now is governing, but in various incarnations, we don't have Nusra all the way through. Um, it has adopted a pragmatic approach. It has adopted a pragmatic approach because it's seeking, in a, in a loose way at least, to attempt to govern by consent or by a degree of consent. And that pragmatism is very dangerous actually, because Islamic State, you knew what you would get, and therefore when the push came to take it back, the people on the ground were saying, they're hiding out over there, right? To go, to, that the forces could go get them. But these guys have socialized themselves into the agenda and amongst the populace of Italy. This is very, very interesting. There was a fascinating interview with a Sharia official of Jabhat al-Nusra, still up on YouTube, where he talks about suspending the Hadud. Hadud is, again, part of the Islamic penal code. It's the more famous punishments, the things that people tend to know about, like chopping the hand. Now, again, Islamic State, when they rolled in, immediately implemented the Hadud. And to, again, to use a very crude and crass barometer, you know, someone's conservatism within the Muslim world, again, you can look at where they stand in the Hadud. Okay? Some people say you can suspend the Hadud, you don't need to implement them today, theorize them. Other people say, no, God has stated the crime and punishment in this case. It's not for me to forgive them. If you look again at that old example I was using before, personal injury already does something to me, and I sustain an injury, I can just choose to forgive them. It's my right to do that, as the aggrieved party. But God forbade alcohol and said, if you consume alcohol, there's a punishment of lashes. Well, so they were so, who am I to forgive them? God stipulated that. That's a crime and punishment to them. So what these guys have done is they've theorized and developed um, a doctrine of saying, you can suspend the halud in times of calamity, in times of war, in times of strife. And look, Syria's going through this very challenging moment right now. It lives up in the air, if anything happens. We are suspending the Hadud. We don't implement it. So part of that battle for legitimacy between Islamic State and Hayat al al Nusra, whatever we call them, was based around this idea. So you guys don't implement the Hadud. You're not real Muslims, right? We're real Muslims. They say, no, you guys have got it wrong. We have thought about this and so on. Again, the point being, you're seeing this new... Uh, I should say, by the way, in, in conservative Islamic circles, like the suspension of the Hadud is this revolutionary statement, just to give you some cultural, religious context. So to see an official Jabhat al-Nusra say, we will suspend the Hadud, 
was breathtaking. I remember watching it thinking, wow, like that is huge. And it's just, again, just to give you some context, this is a big deal. Um, it's that sense of pragmatism. They realize, look, going in hard is not a way of going. And it doesn't win you support on the ground. They're essentially launching their own hearts and minds strategy. And it's an attempt to win a public support. And therefore, you see them far more entrenched in uh, Idlib than you do uh, in, in other parts uh, of country where, again, other non-state actors have attempted to govern. So that makes them the more interesting movement. It's clearly demonstrating why they have durability, much more so than we've seen uh, with Islamic State. And it also shows us how entrenched it is. It's going to be a lot harder, I think, for these guys to extract them uh, out of the uh, equation. And so on a happy note, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as always, very incredible and compelling. So again, I'm going to abuse my privilege and begin by, by posing some questions, and then we'll open it up to the room. So I think that one of the components that we were really getting from today is that these, these five components that Charles has articulated have in many ways served as a unifier for the movement, but at the same time created opportunities for, for divides and different interpretations and what sounds like a Maoist iteration of a protracted war for HTS and a population-centric <coughs> approach. Um, but so as, as we look at this, I want to talk about how these debates and these topics can also be a, a massive vulnerability for the organizations, um, particularly uh, the modern uh, doctrine or interpretation of the doctrinomic fear, uh, which is this excommunication component. Um, so how do we think that this is going to serve as either a rallying point or a tension twixt in between organizations? So on one hand, uh, from, from Zarqawi and, and uh, AQI's relationship with Al-Qaeda, uh, and sort of the role of takfir in that versus what's happening within IS today to um, sort of relationships between organizations, sort of like the Elmer's point you were just making. Thanks. Um, you're right in the sense that takfir has been, uh, it's the most destructive. It's just clearly the most destructive of, of those ideas, and it, it's what's left the really crazy bloodshed. Um, it has been a power movement. It has licensed them to go out and do all these things. But you're also right that once you start that process of othering, so you just keep going. So, you know, it, it observes a Syrian civil war. If you look, like, Islamic State fought everybody. You know, and it was beheading even members of Jafar al Muslim, right? That sort of original parent movement in a sense. Um, why were they doing that? They were doing that because of this basis of the fear, saying, you're not a Muslim anymore. So, what was interesting. And of course, you know this from, from your time at ICSR. When we uh, interviewed lots of Islamic State fighters, um, I just use your smartphones actually, so I'm not traveling. But people, uh, you know, we used to get asked a lot, like, well, do they ever express dissent? Do they ever express like doubt about what they're doing? And to be honest, people didn't, right? It's very interesting to watch some of those same characters now sitting in SDF custody and the <laughs> types of things they're saying. I mean, my God. You know, I sometimes revisit the archive that we've still got and say, mm, it's a very interesting uh, uh, change of uh, tune from this individual. But genuinely, they, they weren't expressing uh, concerns. Like I can say Han Hong, only one time did some guy say, look, really, this is not for me. But he expressed and opened up something which got us thinking, and you could notice it. When they're fighting the Assad regime, or they're fighting the Iraqi government, or they're going after you know, beleaguered minorities, the Yazids, and none of this affected them. But when they fought Jabhat al-Nusra or Akhrar al-Sham, or some of the Sunni groups, that got them thinking, is this just? And that was the only thing that triggered them. It's amazing to think about all the other atrocities that didn't, they didn't flinch, but this thing, beheading the member of Jabhat al-Nusra, that concerned them. And that was a point of dissonance uh, in, in their uh, uh, mind. So, you're right in that the fear is very destructive in the sense of you know, forcing the two uh, uh, groups to fight. But even internally within uh, Islamic State, I mean, there was an extremist wing, if you could believe there is such a thing, the Hazmi sect, which again took this issue of the fear very, very far and criticized the group. I, I won't bore you with all the details, but essentially it comes down how do you pronounce the fear? Do you make it on the individual and say, right, you are not a Muslim anymore because of this? Or do you apply it to an entire group and say every member of Jabhat al-Nusra 
is now not Muslim because the group has done this? Or do you individually interrogate this group? So that issue, uh, again, creates a lot of debate and dissent within uh, the movement, not so much in the Nusra movement, but particularly with reference to groups like Hamas, for example. Like some people are very sympathetic to them within Islamic State or elsewhere and say, oh, well, I'm not sure, like it's every individual member has to be condemned and so on. So it does provoke a lot of uh, uh, problems even within groups and creates a sense of fracturing within Islamic State in terms of ideologically these where people stood, or indeed between jihadi groups uh, as well. So yeah, I can't get away from the fact. If I can take one of those ideas out from the five that I talk about, say, okay, you, you know, somehow wave the magic wand and this one will evaporate, it will be so clear because that is really what uh, has just you know, devastated. So um, one of the points during your presentation that you sort of address is the idea of ad hoc in real time, sort of ideological adaptation. And much of what we were, you were speaking about was how, how it's happening on the ground and whether it's dealing with the Jordanian pilot burning or, or other iterations and examples might be things like um, you know, the legitimacy of, of sex slaves and the, these are things that the Islamic State was dealing with. But at the same time, we also have the rise of uh, communications technology um, and sort of looking at what, what that means because uh, people online are chatting about the third nullifier and these very, very specific nitty gritty components of even things like takfir. And then you've done great work on, on pieces like Greenbirds where even leaders who are in ISIS controlled territory are really dominating a lot of the narrative online, whether it's Abu Bara and Sheikh uh, Ahmed Musa Jibril. So how do you think um, communications and the rise of technologies have allowed more people to engage with these ideas uh, and participate in these debates? And what do you think it means for the future of the movement? Okay. Um, well, I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, it goes without saying, of course, the, the internet has, and the social media in particular, allowed these ideas to proliferate much faster than they ever would have done without, without it. Um, and again, you know, I'm sure the debate in DC very similar to the debate in London, which is government just going after big tech saying, get this stuff down, get rid of it, we don't want it. And you're seeing tech respond to that stuff, the Christchurch massacre, and Facebook was really quick to come out and say, look, this thing was shared like 1.5 million times, 1.3 million times it was detected automatically, it was uh, detected before it was uploaded, we blocked it. So there's, you know, tech is moving to, to address that problem. Um, what do you think it's too much or too slow or not enough, or whatever, that's, but there's clearly a movement to address that issue. You can see today, uh, in fact, just how much harder it is to try and get some of that material. I was with a colleague last night who uh, works with us, he's now a uh, financial working for tech companies, and I was telling him about, you know, just if you go and type in some really old school, prominent, Olaki material, you know, it doesn't come up on the first page of Google anymore. It's not easily accessible. This is a lot of materials absolutely everywhere. So on the one hand, you know, that environment, the world was very different. And of course we were ourselves, right? How did I see sorry, but it was all there for everyone to see. We just systematized the way to collect it and to analyze it uh, quicker than others. But essentially, you know, anyone could have done what we did because it was all there. What was really interesting, and this got me thinking as well, is you can see now it's all migrated to Telegram. Telegram's a clunky platform. You have to deliberately go seek it out. It's a lot harder. But back when, again, when it was all just sitting on Twitter and Facebook and so on, you know, we've got a lot of media attention. And my cousin, who's 20, is at university and sees me popping up on the news talking about stuff and says, oh, that's interesting, and goes and starts following a bunch of foreign fighters on Twitter because he wants to do it. So he's not in this world. He doesn't work on these issues. He's a market, but he's just interested. So that ability to casually encounter, or accidentally encounter, or just easily encounter, jihadist material was the norm in 2014, and 15, and 16. And it was available for all, and therefore, the pool was much easier. The barriers to entry were much lower. Now, if he sees me on TV and talk about Telegram, you know, that requires several conscious steps and effort, and you, to build a good, presence of Telegram would take several days. So the online environment has changed. And I think it's, it's got uh, uh, much more hard, and which is a good thing. Um, what makes our lives harder to get the material, but 
final point I'll make on this, though, is also, you're right, there was a very important moment where, because the fighters themselves were communicating, it wasn't like the old days. So if you were a radical in 2008, you, know, you basically sat around waiting for an old lucky video to come out, which would pop up on the internet, and you are the recipient of that. Okay, and this is an old Arab guy somewhere in Yemen, so in Saudi, it's detached, it's remote from you. Now, again, you'll be a young 20-year-old guy in Bradford, or in Paris, or in Berlin, who is thinking about Islamic State, thinking, God, this is an interesting group. You could find another 20-year-old from your hometown who's traveled out there and chat to them. And now you're speaking peer-to-peer, -peer, right? It's not this sort of mythical old Arab guy out in the Middle East doing things. It's the guy who went to the other high school down the road. And that was one of the most powerful things we saw. The fighters were just saying, I'm not special. If I can do it, you can do it. It's that normalization of the process. Uh, and you can also, again, you know, if you look at the Zawahiri videos, right, they're like hours long, boring as hell. These guys were saying they're not interested in that. By the time you're seeking it out, you're kind of into that world. They were saying to the other guys, like, how did you tell your mother you joined us? So getting over those emotional barriers to participation was what the real discussion was about. But that also allowed these guys, again, completely nobles, right? 20 year old kid who's gone out and joined Islamic State who doesn't. Uh, know, you know their own ideology as well as uh, you know, people in our office. But they essentially set themselves up as authorities. I'm here, I'm pro uh, approximate to this. And it's, it's an area I'm working on a lot right now, which is essentially how the jihadi movement establishes uh, legitimacy for itself via practice in a completely different way than normative Islamic ways of authority, so the Ijaz, and so just, we're here, we're doing this, therefore we have legitimacy. And you can see that right down from the Youngest members of Islamic State. Again, you know, tech and social media made that possible. That anyone could be uh, an authority. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna have, or we're gonna open up if you wanna. Open yeah. People and we'll just. Great. Do you um, talk at all in your book Excuse about? Me. Oh, sorry. sorry uh, do you uh, talk at all in your book about the Salafist movement in the United States? No, I, I don't really talk about. Um, I think PME did a report though, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I don't talk about, I'm, I'm really not interested in that side of it in the book, at least. It's just the core ideologues, the key ideologues, uh -huh. and their evolution of these ideas, how they push the ideas out. So, in, in essence, you know, even, even the core events like 9 11 are only discussed in relation to how the jihadi movement conceptualized it as an idea. Um, but no, it's not a sort of sociological study in that sense. Yeah, excuse. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, uh, talking about vulnerabilities, I mean, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts looking ahead in terms of um, if, let's say, over the next several years, there might be a uh, lessening of um, support for those ideas? What would be some of the ways in which that might unfold? Yes. I'm not sure there will be a lessening of support. I think in the immediate short term, the pushing back and the rolling up of Islamic State territory is hugely important. Because, again, ideas and things, okay, these things exist, right? You can't kill an idea. But ideas still work best when they're given expression and when they have momentum on their side. So if you are, again, you know, that 20 year old who's really excited by Islamic State, in 2014, it seems like a good moment to go. In 2015, it seems like a good moment to go. But today, it seems like a terrible moment to go. Right. <laughs> so nobody is, that tipping point isn't there. You can hold all the ideas still, but that tipping point moment hasn't quite come alive for you. You can see again, you know, particularly in Europe and in the UK, in 2017, you know, as ISIS was being hit, their supporters were responding to that call <laughs> to say, do something at home, we have a terrible summer, like wave after wave of attack some very terrible attacks. Um, so there was a sense that, okay, um, the idea had that resonance still, but now, in particular, it's really momentum strong. However, we've seen all this before. Al-Qaeda in Iraq defeated, right? Supposedly, it waits, it bites time. These groups are fantastic at exploiting and filling the, the space of the political vulnerabilities more broadly than exist in the Middle East. 
that in Assyria is anywhere near being a recovered state is, you know, it's just not. I mean, it will be a generational crisis uh, for Syria, and that means the jihadist movement will continue to have a great opportunity there to continue to exploit uh, uh, the situation. So I'm not entirely sure um, uh, that this will slow down. It's, it's a series of ebbs and flows, like the tides, you know, they come in and they go out. And at the moment, for the short term, you'll see it push back, but uh, this is far from over, it's far from big. And I will just say this point, the next big issue, which no one has yet come up with a good idea about is, what do we do with all these guys in SDF custody? That, we've done the hard work, right? We've destroyed the state, we've captured these guys, we're terrible, terrible people. We're leaving them in these camps, in the most vulnerable place in the world, with a non-state actor that doesn't have the ability to hold them effectively. So isn't this what we did in Camp Ruka? Baghdadi came out of that place. But we've done this literally about a decade ago, and we're just watching it all happen again. So there's got to be, and particularly you know, in the UK, obviously where I live, guys, watching history repeat itself. You have to get an effective program for these guys, get them, you know, make sure they're never released. And that's gonna come about uh, by having some effective international mechanism by which you can uh, do something with them. And it's also, of course, really important for their victims. The Yazidis and others deserve to see these guys get put away for the rest of their lives. But I fear that that may not happen. These, the longer they stay in SDF custody, the better chance there is that they'll get out at some point. data from 2014 or 13 when we started collecting through to about the end of 16. It was all relevant to Syria, it was all a wash, right? it was all online. Um, there was a platform called Ask FM where they, where they all operated. Like That was one of the most uh, intense places for us to see these questions and the way, you know, what questions people were putting forward. Um, we have not seen that in, in other places, like South Africa, uh, or the Philippines, for that matter of fact, or elsewhere. Um, so the scale and the volume of everything is very different, but I clearly suggest that the, uh, the principles are the same. If you're going to go up into an ISIS in uh, Syria, you'd probably be carrying the exact same emotion and fear as you would if you were going to join them in the Philippines. I'll try not to ramble, but the best lectures, and I think you gave a great lecture once where you really don't have your thoughts figured out. And what I'd like you to try to do is help me connect a few points. First, you, you talked a little bit about the affiliates, Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb, dot, dot, dot. There is, is the Islamic State going to be a disincentive? Because the Islamic State, I think we can recognize with the caliph and so on and so forth, was a one-off occupied territory, so on and so forth. But what does this mean for the remainder of the affiliates? You said they go all the way from the Philippines over to Arcane. Is will this focus more? Uh, it certainly won't be an incentive, but will it do anything to these other affiliates that are causing so much more trouble in the Sinai, in the Philippines, Mauritania, Mali, so on and so forth? That that's question number one. And the one that I'm really struggling with is somebody that was in Iraq uh, at the very time that both Al Qaeda in Iraq was merging with Zarqawi and his group. At the same time, we had the Shia revival inside of Iraq, which in many ways accelerated that same process back and forth. What, what is going to happen? 
incredibly effective in expanding Shia militias that we're seeing in places such as Iraq and Syria as well. Is this going to accelerate this struggle for the Salafis, the, the armed jihadis? What does that mean in this struggle between the Shias who are reviving, particularly the Najaf Shia, and these movements? So, I'm sorry I ran out of time. I'm trying to put this all together in my head based on what you said. Okay. Fine. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think in relation to the first part of your question, so for Islamists there'd be a disincentive for these other groups and what they've seen and so I don't think it'll be a disincentive in so far as their ambition to gain territory, to try and hold that territory, to build a proto state of the type that the Islamic State did. What will happen is kind of what I uh, spoke about the, at the end of my presentation, where I was saying we can see with Jabhat al Nusra, Hayat al Sham uh, today, that they've learned from the previous experience of what Zarqawi did in Iraq, saying that barbarism that's really hardcore, committed to ultra violence, uh, is a pretty bad way to hold territory because, unsurprisingly, the people you're ruling over don't like it. Um, and so you're seeing a more pragmatic movement emerge, a more intelligent movement. I mean, you know, Al-Qaeda has staying power to the extent that it is smart, it does adapt to what is happening. Whereas if you look at Islamic State, if you were rational and you were in the group in 2015, you'd be saying to them, don't attack the West. You've got this thing on the ground here that is the most powerful local actor. The West is looking to not get involved. Don't create the conditions for your own demise. But they couldn't help themselves. They couldn't help themselves because that's who they are. They're hostages to ideology in that sense. But these other groups have become smarter. So rather than to, you know, Islamic State, or the example of Islamic State being a disincentive, I think it'll be a learning moment for the movements. It will uh, still inspire them because they say, we can do it, we're just learning better how to get to that final goal. Um, so I think there's a lot there for them to digest. And as I say, you can see in Idlib the sort of fruits of that more intelligent strategy. In relation to Shia militias, um, you're right. Look, I, I mentioned, I mean, you know, I studied the Sunni side of this, and that's uh, what I'm interested in, but the Shia militias are using the same millenary language. It's the same discussion about saving Islam, the future direction of Islam. To the extent, again, if you don't, if there are comedic, if it wasn't so tragic, videos on YouTube where you can see them like, walking, talking to each other. Complete nonsense. Our dead are in heaven, yours are in hell. No, ours are in heaven, yours are in hell. It's, it's, it's like a Monty Python sketch. <laughs> and it's nonsense. Um, so both sides have this commitment to millenarianism. Both sides have uh, uh, this highly dogmatic stance about where they stand. So it is problematic. It is problematic. But the one thing I would say, I'm certainly no expert uh, on uh, the Shia, but their structure is much more formalized than in Sunni Islam, and therefore there is an ability to control what happens, right? If the leadership of various orders and stuff comes out and says, guys, stop this, you can rein it in a bit. Um, so I would say, if, if you are interested, I have a colleague uh, who works for me at ICSR, she's now our expert on this issue. There are several reports on our website, icsr.info, where you can go and download them, uh, which look at the Shia militias, to look at the future of Hashd al-Shabi. In fact, in London next week, uh, we have one of the commanders of Hashd al-Shabi coming who will give a talk about the future uh, of those movements there. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll find a way to get it online or something. But there's a lady there, yeah. Um, Audrey Shira, thank you so much. Brilliant, as always. Um, I'm going to loop back and touch on something you just covered, which is a, it interests me because I think um, looking at the pragmatism that you mentioned from Hayat Sham and specifically the, the Hadood example, one of the things that we see is that the um, leniency or the pragmatism that you're describing is effective in the short term, but do you think that were this fracturing that ends up developing with those small groups really harping on that 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Get them all together. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You still have them? Yeah. A couple of people asked now about Al Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates and groups sort of outside the, the core Middle East. I was wondering if you could address on sort of more of the ideas level how the Safi jihadi ideas were seen after the 1980s war in Afghanistan to actualize at least violently primarily in, uh, in the Arab world. Why and kind of how they seem to spread so much in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia versus in the 1990s? Some small questions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I wanted to come back to a uh, yeah. clarification, but I'll, I'll start uh, with reference to your point. Um, it's the great sort of unanswered right? what happens with this process of uh, pragmatism, because clearly you have you know these groups start off as absolutists, right? And that's what we saw in Islam: we said, no compromise. This is who we are. That's what we're doing. Now you're seeing in Idlib this more interesting line of issues. Suspension of Hadoo, of this difference of, you know, um, pragmat it's important. It's pragmatism rather than moderation. But the more interesting point is, does pragmatism open the door to moderation? Because once people are sort of socialized in, you've started to govern now by consent a little bit, and you, you know, again, there are a lot of people there, a lot of the displaced people, from other parts of Syria who have been sent there, who or who've chosen to go there. That says something in and of itself, right? There are still parts of the secular revolution that demonstrate on the streets of Idlib. People who chose not to stay under the Assad regime but to go there and live under that. You have to respond to people's demands. You have to respond to public opinion. Uh, and so I think ultimately, it's gonna be hard for them to get to a point where they now say, we're gonna start implementing the Hadoop, for example. Because you've sort of made this now the de facto position. And that pragmatism for power, that pragmatism in pursuit of power, does, to my mind at least, create the conditions in which you could go in and push them harder, right, to, to embrace things. Ultimately, groups like this do end by being pushed and shunted through a political process into different areas. So we've seen that uh, around the world. A lot of literature talks about it. It's one way to end terrorist movements is you bring them in get them to keep compromising. So I think there's opportunities, whether it comes true or not, who knows. But one thing I will say, I've studied Syria for the last you know, seven, eight years, this, this gruesome war, is that every time you think you've worked it out, everything changes the next day, at every stage. And every time you think it's got as brutal as, as it will get, a trap door opens and you see another layer, uh, which is un inconceivable. So who knows? Um, but I do think there's an opportunity in Idlib, whether it's realized or not, who knows? But it's an interesting trajectory. So in relation to your question, I'm just trying to uh, clarify exactly what. So why do these groups proliferate essentially outside the sort of direct core Middle East and Gulf essentially? Right? Not only why, but why did this ideology become appealing to a much broader area, it seems like? Mm, okay. Well, I think there's probably twofold uh, sort of aspect to this. Why did it become more appealing? Well, 9-11 was used by a group like to demonstrate success, right? Because look, we could do this. Here's what we've pulled off and achieved. And then the fighting essentially that happened thereafter in Afghanistan and Iraq did seem to give encouragement to other groups who are responding to their own political reality. I mean, Al Shabaab is a reflection of the reality there. Boko Haram is a reflection of the political reality in Nigeria and elsewhere. So these were always countries that had problems of their own. But here were movements and groups that effectively could do two things. They could uh, take confidence and encouragement from what they saw happening elsewhere, but also branding works as well, right? So if you say, look, Islamic State is the group that's up now, we'll call ourselves Islamic State in Libya, or Islamic State in the Philippines, it allows you just to start to get momentum uh, uh, and, and to affiliate at least in terms of power over things. At times, I suppose, to request resources uh, would, would have been important. So I think those are the <coughs> political level, but, uh, in terms of uh, also, you know, why is it more popular to broader uh, populace as well? Again, we have limited insight into what people were saying and thinking and doing with the, uh, in the 1980s when they fought in the Soviet Union. Because there are some branches, uh, there are some magazines that you can get to, but they sit in repositories and archives. And 
But again, particularly a few years ago, you would just go to Twitter or Google or whatever, and you could access all sorts of more people had access to the ideas. And I think you could just see a sort of snowballing occurring, particularly with Syria. One foreign fighter goes from a town, two were gonna go from that town. Two went four went, and four went eight, and it just grew exponentially because of that encouragement and stuff that people took from one another, that the dynamic and that interplay between the abstraction of the idea, which is the seven keys to have the ideal, and the reality of playing out around you. Politics and the momentum of it all, people took a lot of uh, uh, encouragement from it. So it, it just developed in a, in a completely unpredictable manner. Okay, incredible. So I'm going to begin wrapping up, and maybe for the first time ever, a POE event will end at the set time. <laughs> Dare to dream. Um, so I want to begin by saying thank you all for coming to this event. Uh, it's a, such a great opportunity to be able to sit down with you in sort of a formal setting and, and discuss some of the ideas and, and ask you questions that I, are looming in my mind. Um, so I think what's, what's so important about this discussion today is sort of the, the point Shiraz made about um, the opportunism and pragmatism and sort of ad hoc nature of these really deep, deep ideas and, and how they can evolve. So really, um, I think it's about understanding how we can use the history of an idea to understand where it's going and, and what we can do to cope with it and, and navigate whether it's finding opportunism, opportunism with opportunism or trying to aggregate, or not aggregate, aggregate these divides within the organization. So um, to put a shameless plug for ICSR and uh, our great POE family across the pond, they have incredible products. Um, from my colleagues who are working on, on gender there to uh, rehabilitation. Please check out their reports at icsr.info, yeah. um, their site. Uh, they have tons of different products, sort of what, what POE tries to do uh, is very much in line with what, what they're doing across the pond. Um, so thank you for all of your great work. And I want to put our hands together to, to thank Shiraz for his contribution, both in the, the book and his willingness to answer our questions about the fear. Uh, and for venturing across the pond during a rainy day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.